Hello, this is Ms. DB. In this video, we are going to work on Chapter 11, Section 2 on exponential functions. So we're going to learn to evaluate exponential functions and identify and graph exponential functions. We'll be working even more with the graphing in another assignment where we'll use Sketchpad or Desmos to graph the, the exponential functions. They're a little tricky to do by hand. Technology helps a lot with that. All right, so here we have a table. This is time in days versus the population of some insects. So you can see that as the days increase in a orderly fashion, each one is plus one, the population is increasing by times three. This is very much like the geometric sequences that we did in 11.1. .1. And if we graph that, we can see that they are increasing not at a linear rate, not at a quadratic rate, but an exponential rate. So it starts out kind of slow and then it starts to increase rather rapidly. This is an example of an exponential function. A rule that describes this pattern, this one here, could be written as 2 times 3 to the x. The 2 is what population we started with, and the 3 is that common ratio, what we are multiplying each time each day. It is to the x power, so our variable is an exponent. That's different than the other functions we have looked at so far. So an exponential function has that form where it's some number a times b to the x, and it really is a times b to the x, where you figure this part out first and then multiply it by a. a cannot be 0 because then this whole thing would be 0. b can't be 1 because um, 1 to any power is just 1, and b has to be greater than 0. So there's some... There's some stuff to do with the variables here at the end. All of the functions that I give you will fit this. You know, they'll they'll meet these um, these these requirements here. All right, so let's look at some examples of how we would evaluate an exponential function. This is the function f of x equals 500 times 1.035 to the x power. They've already figured out what the function is and wrote it for you. Now we're going to finish this question. It says, how much money will there be in six years? And they tell us that x is the number of years. So this x here, this variable, represents the number of years. So all we have to do is replace x with the 6, and then we have to carefully use our calculators to evaluate this. Now remember, we talked about this when doing, when figuring out geometric sequences. You have to do this part first. Do this on your calculator first, then multiply by the 500. So the first thing you do is the exponents, because please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, the order of operations tells us that you have to do the exponents, which is right here, that's the e, before you do multiply which is right here. So exponents happens before you multiply. So if you get your calculator out and type in 1.035 and then figure out where your exponent button is, you go to the sixth power, you should get 1.22925532 Now it's a really long number. Don't round that number. Leave it on your calculator. You don't even have to write it down then multiply that by 500. So leave it on your calculator, and I get 614.627. Now their number is slightly different. They rounded to the nearest hundredth, but they rounded after they figured out. So if you had rounded that 1.229255, if you had rounded that to like 1.2, 1.2 and then multiply that times 500 it changes your overall answer to exactly 600 it changes it by more than 14 difference and it would be wrong it's too low i mean 14 dollars is 14 dollars. you don't want to lose that money so don't round these leave the calculation on your calculator and then continue with the rest of what you have to multiply by this is just another example. Again, they're giving us the function. This time it's about the population of a city. X represents the years. 
and they want to know if we replace x with seven years, what would the population be after seven years? So again, we're going to use a calculator. This time they're just showing us the final answer because they didn't want to uh, write down what the rounded number would be because that's not as accurate as leaving that whole 0.98 to the seventh. Now another thing you don't want to do is, other than don't round, is you don't want to multiply this part first and then take that to the seventh power. If you had written 200,000 times 0.98, that is 196,000. And then you raise that to the seventh power, you get a huge, enormous number. Like the population would be in the bazillions. So that's not how you do it. You make sure that you, I have to erase this now. Whoops, that's not how you erase. You make sure that you take the, the 0.98 to the seventh power first. That's the part that has to be done first. And then you multiply by your starting value. So this amount, this part here is the first calculation you do. Then you multiply by 200,000. All right, so these are the problems from your worksheet. Four, five, that we'll get to one through three in a minute. This worksheet doesn't go exactly in order as our lesson does here. But when you get to four, five, and 11 is very much like this. These are the functions are given to you. And then later on, they say, solve this, evaluate this when x equals, and then they'll give you a number. So here they're giving you to use 12 for x. Um, in number 11, they want us to use 6 for the number of the bounce. So let's see, let's look at number 5. Number 5 kind of is nice because it kind of shows how they wrote this equation. So it says a population of pigs is expected to increase at a rate of 4% each year. If the original population is 1,000, here's the function. You can see where these parts of this function came from. The 1,000 is the starting value. The, there's the 0 0.04. If you took 4% and changed it to a decimal, it's 0 0.04, and they added 1 to that. And this is an example of an equation, a function, for exponential growth. And then it's to the x power. And you'll do more with this, especially in Algebra 2, with exponential growth. So here's the function, f of x equals 1,000 times 1.04 to the x power, but we want to know what will it be after 12 years. So you replace the x with 12. Then we do this part of the equation next. f of x is just writing this in function notation. This could have also said y equals. Either one is fine. And so then you get your calculator out, and you type in 1.04 to the 12th power. And it's not a huge number because it's 1.04. So if you round it, you're going to lose a lot of the information that you need. You're going to lose a lot of those numbers. Let me show you on, this is the computer calculator is not exactly the same as my handheld, but it's, it's good enough. And every computer has a calculator. If you want also, Desmos has a scientific calculator that's online. Just go to desmos.com, and instead of going to graphing calculator, go to scientific calculator, or Sketchpad has a calculator as well under the number menu. Let me show you that one. It's actually a better calculator than this computer one I have. So right here under number, there's a calculator. So I was supposed to take, now I can't see the... I'm supposed to take 1.04 to the 12th power. So 1.04. On this calculator, it's x to the y to use the exponent. And then to the 12th power. And all of those digits are important. I don't want to just round to 1.6. So I just leave all of that on the calculator. I don't have to write it down. I'm now I'm going to multiply that by 1,000 and I get 1,601 point and so on. So that's the number that I would have. I wish I could copy this, but I don't think I can. Nope. So 1.601.03. And 
there's some more digits after that that you can include if you wanted to. And let's see, is that, yep, that's everything I need then is, that's, that question has been answered. All right, let's look at what is next. Um, linear functions have constant first differences and quadratic functions have constant second differences. Exponential functions do not have constant differences, but they do have constant ratios. So if you're given some data, if you're given some points, you can write them in a table format and then you can check. The first thing you wanna check is are the x values increasing at a constant rate? They do need to be increasing at a constant rate for this to work. These are, so then I'm gonna move over to the, the y values, the answers here. Now the first difference is this would be plus 12, 54 minus 18 is 36. So this is plus 36 and 162 minus 54. These are the first differences is 108. So clearly the first differences are not constant. If it was constant, then you'd say it was linear. And then your second differences is you figure out what is the difference of the differences. So from 12 to 36 or 36 minus 12, that's plus 24. And from 36 to 108 is not going to be 24, it's plus 72. So the first differences are not constant. The second differences are not constant. However, as we saw with geometric sequences, if you divide the terms that are right next to each other, then you get a constant ratio. So 162 divided by 54 is 3. 54 divided by 18 is 3. 18 divided by 6 is 3. So these are all constant. That means that it's an exponential function. That tells you that you have an exponential function. So you can check that with problems and you can see if it's an exponential function, then you are able to use this, this model of this function. It, it should work. R is going to be the constant ratio and it's what B is. So R would be right there, just like when you did the geometric sequences in the last lesson. A is the first term. All right, so in order to tell whether or not it's exponential, it helps a lot if you put it in a table. So you can go ahead and find the first differences, second differences, third differences if you want, but since we're in a chapter on exponential differences and the question is going to say, is this exponential or not, you can just go right to finding the ratio between the consecutive terms. So 108 divided by 36, 36 divided by 12, 12 divided by four, and you'll find that the common ratio is three. Since, the common, since there is a common ratio, then you would say that yes, this is exponential. And again, put them in a table first, and then again, if you want, you can practice finding the first and second differences, or you can just go right ahead to finding the common ratio between the consecutive terms. Now, the first thing you should check is, are the X values increasing by the same amount? And in this case, they're all plus one. So then we can go ahead and use the common ratios method. So you would take 128 divided by 64. 128 divided by 64 is two. But, whoops, where did my pen go? Oh, there it is. <laughs> and then what about 64 divided by zero? It's undefined, you can't even find it. 0 divided by negative 64 is 0. These are not constant ratio. So you would say no because there is not a constant ratio. In fact, if you had checked the first differences, you would see that they are all the y values are all increasing at a constant rate. So this is linear, not exponential. But you don't have to, on the worksheet, you don't have to say that it's linear unless you want to but you do have to say that it's not exponential because there's no common ratio. So here's the problems from your worksheet. We start off one, two, and three with these, and then 12 and 13 are asking the same thing, but there's no table. Let's do one of those, let's do 13. So I'm going to first make a table for X and Y, just a simple table, and I'll put the coordinates in like this, two, 10, three, 15, and four, 20. 
and I check the x coordinates and they are all increasing by one which means I can go ahead and check and see if I have common ratios between these that would mean it was exponential. Now I'm already looking at this going I think this is going to be linear because from 5 to 10 is 5, from 10 to 15 is 5, from 15 to 20. This is a linear. But I could go ahead and check the ratios. I would take 20 divided by 15 and 15 divided by 10 and 10 divided by 5. In order for this to be exponential all of these numbers would have to be the same and I know they're not going to be the same because two of them already are not. I don't even have to figure out what 20 divided by 15 is because I will just be able to say no no common ratio and if you want you can add this is a linear function you don't have to add that if you don't want to but it might be good practice for you to remember what linear means and you'll do that for the other ones as well find out if it has a common ratio and if it does you would say yes it's exponential if it doesn't you would say no it is not exponential now we're going to look at graphing just a little bit, but we will finish graphing more in another assignment using technology. You can um, generate some points and graph them, and these are what the graphs will look like. It'll be one of these four looking things. If, if both your a, here's your general function again, a times b to the x. If your values of a and b are if a is greater than 0, it can be a decimal like 0.5, but it has to be greater than 0, and b is greater than 1, then you'll get something like this, this first one. If a is less than 0, meaning it's negative, but hey, this should say b is greater than 1, and b is greater than 1, then you'll get this kind of a situation. If a is greater than 0 and b is a fraction between 0 and 1, then you'll get it looks almost like this one but it's slanting the other way and then the last case is um, this one where a is less than zero and b is a fraction then you'll have this sort of situation so when you graph again you can make a table of values you can say I'm gonna let x be and don't let x be very big numbers because it's gonna grow really fast and then you use a calculator and plug in the different values and find what you get and here's what they got for this one then you would plot those on a graph on a coordinate system with grid paper and connect them with a smooth curve. So there's an example of this one. Now they ended at 2 and 2. That might be a little bit low. They might they maybe should have included one more point to see how fast it's going to grow and that would be a little bit better. Like I said we will mostly be graphing with technology rather than doing these by hand. But you can plug them in, get a some points on the graph and then you plot those points. This one's really hard to plot because when x is negative 1, look how tiny y is. It's negative 1 eighth, which is like almost on the line, the x-axis. So very, very close together. And I don't know if these points, if you'd be accurate enough to be able to see that then it goes downhill really fast. So you can see that all of them are going to match one of those basic forms, but some of the numbers are really small and hard to graph. This is just one more example. And you know 6.67, 1.44, you really have to just estimate when you're plotting those points on a graph. However, if you use technology, you can get a really accurate look at this graph. So I'm going to open up Sketchpad right now and graph this negative 3 times 2 to the x in Sketchpad. And you could also graph this in Desmos. It would be, um, it would look exactly the same. So I'm going to graph plot new function and I want to graph, I don't type the y equals, just the negative 3 times, I'm going to use my parentheses here, 2 to the x power and I check up here to make sure that that looks exactly like it should, and it does, so then I click OK. And here is the graph of that function. So I could plot some, a table of values, and those table of values, those points, should end up exactly on that graph. And here they have some table of values for us to complete. So let's, let's do some 
values and then plot them on the graph and see, make sure that they end up in the same place. So at negative 1, when x is negative 1, I'd have negative 3 times 2 to the negative 1. Now 2 to the negative 1 is the same as 1 half. So this is going to equal 3 times 1 half, or negative 3 halves, or as a decimal that would be negative 1.5. 0 will be a little bit easier. I'd have 2 to the 0. Anything to the 0 power is 1, so this is negative 3 times 1, or negative 3. All right, let's keep going. Negative 3 times 2 to the 1, that'd be negative 3 times 2, because 2 to the 1 power is just 2, or negative 6. At 2, I'd have 2 to the second power, so I'd have negative 3 times 2 squared is 4, and that's negative 12. And I'll do one more, negative 3 times 2 to the third power. 2 to the third power means 2 times 2 times 2, which is not 6, it's 8. And negative 3 times 8 is negative 24. Let's plot these points on the same graph in Sketchpad and make sure that they will end up in the right place on the graph. They should be right on the line. I might not be able to see the 3, negative 24 one unless I zoom way out, though. So I'm going to go to Plot Points. And my first one is negative 1. And that the y value of that is negative 1.5. And the next one is 0 and negative 3. And then I have 1 and negative 6. Oops, negative 6. 2 and negative 12. And the last point I need to put on here is 3 and negative 24. And again, you can plot these in Desmos by using a table. done and let's look at these points so I only see two of them right now but I could go down and see more I can also zoom out by clicking on this point here and dragging towards the origin that changes the scale so that I can zoom out and maybe now I can see that other value that yep there it is so they're all on the graph if you need to make your graph longer, if it didn't, oh, that looks plenty long. Like on this side, there's an arrow there. You can click and drag. And if I zoom back in, you can see that that is going to follow along the x-axis on this side. It's never going to cross over the x-axis. The x-axis is called an asymptote, and it, it's a boundary line for that function. So then for the problem on your worksheet, you can take a, a picture of that or you could attach it, um, attach the Sketchpad file. Or in Desmos, there's a way to share your graph by sharing a link. And there's a few problems at the end. Um, number 14 is just multiple choice. Pick the one that shows an exponential function. Only one of them is exponential. And I'll give you a giant hint that it's not D. And in 15, here's an exponential function, and they just want us to replace x with 4. So you would just solve this like we did, you know, several of our other problems. And in number 16, this is an interesting question with a fractal. This is a kind of cool design where the pattern continues. And if you zoom in, there's more. It, it'll look like this, but smaller. So it, they want you to try to figure out which of these functions, which equation, would model what's happening at stage 0, stage 1, and stage 2. Which one is correct for how many squares there would be in each of these pictures? And that's it. We'll continue working with exponential functions in the next lesson as well. Thank you very much and have a great day.